This is uh, 14, 8 through 15. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of fools is deception. Fools mock at making amends for sin, but goodwill is found among the upright. Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Even in laughter the heart may ache, and rejoicing may end in grief. The faithless will be fully repaid for their ways, and the good rewarded for theirs. The simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. Let us pray. O Christ, eternal Son of God, you are wisdom. And we pray that you would pour wisdom out on us, that we would be hearers and doers of your word unto your glory and the good of our neighbor. We ask these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. In our last uh, sermon on Proverbs, we looked at the verses just prior to this in chapter 14, and we concluded as our doctrine that one builds a household, which could be many things. It could be a literal family. You could think of a kingdom also. Um, that one builds a household on the basis of the fear of the Lord, which at least entails two things, wise speech and prudent industry. We could state that another way so as to really connect with the whole of the book of Proverbs. We could state it this way. We build a household by remaining on the well-worn path of the faithful. You could say it even simpler. We are called to walk by faith. That's important because now as we move into these next observations, we're going to see that there is a, a completion of that thought. We are called to walk by faith, and what you'll end up seeing in this proverb grouping is, and not by appearances. We are to walk by faith and not by appearances. So let's make a few observations, and then I have a very brief uh, exhortation. Here we have another proverb where the verses uh, from the beginning, so the very first verse and then the last verse, they match. And that's going to happen all the way into the center. It's another, it's structured like that again. And so we'll just begin by making a few observations of these matching pairs and we'll work our way to the center. The first matching pair, therefore, are verses 8 and 15. The contrast in the Proverb 8 and in Proverb 15, and they're supposed to comment on each other, the contrast is between the wise and the foolish. The wise is different than the foolish because the wise in this particular case has, have insight into what path they choose for their life endeavors. They can see clearly what the path is and whether it should be walked on or not. They see, and this is the most important point, where the path leads. That's the emphasis throughout this whole proverb section is the destiny of paths. The fool is self-deceived and tries to deceive others about their chosen way. Now let me give you an example from earlier in Proverbs. This is from Proverbs 1, 11 through 14. If they say, this is the father speaking to the son or the daughter, if they say, come along with us, let's lie in wait for innocent blood, let's ambush some harmless soul, let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit, we'll get all sorts of valuable things and we'll fill our houses with plunder, come on, cast lots with us and we will all share the loot. To the full, that seems like a good way to become wealthy and to live a good life. Someone has just put together a plan in order for them to have some money, to buy things that they've always wanted. And if they are strong enough, those fools, there is no real threat. No one will be able to stop them. If they are sneaky enough, no one will know that it was them to begin with. But the wise, the wise see the real ends of that path. It appears like the path is fine because they would not get caught. 
they're too strong or they're too sneaky. But the Y sees, even if they're not caught now, even if they're too strong now, there will be one day when they will be caught and they'll be weak. They see the end of that path. In fact, the father follows up that same section in Proverbs with 17 and 18 of chapter 1. He says this, How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. You see how the father can see the path, though the, the youth would be tempted to think, Oh, what a great plan. No one could stop us, and I could finally get the things that I wanted to get. And that's what's going on here with 8 and 15. The fool's path, this is key, the fool's path may appear to be the road to success, but the wise are the ones that know the true destination of those paths. That's part of what it means to be wise, is to be able to see through the appearance of things into the reality of it, because you are informed by God and his word. So that's the first observation. There's the two ends, 8 and 15. Now the next match is 9 and 14. And essentially the point is this, upright people do not involve themselves in situations in which they incur guilt, and if they do commit wrong, they make appropriate reparations. You can see there in 9, fools mock at making amends for sin, but goodwill is found among the upright. And then the match in 14, the faithless will be fully repaid for their ways, and the good rewarded for theirs. The fool doesn't think that way. The fool deals unfairly with people, and they feel no need to make amends. They don't feel need to make amends because they think they are in some sense unstoppable. No one can hold them accountable. They are too strong. They are too sneaky. And honestly, if you were to look out at the world, at the wicked, does it not seem like they can just get away with murder? Who would stop them? Well, that's the point of the proverb here the youth would be tempted to think, well, I could just join them. But the wise are different because the wise see beyond everyday appearances. They know that the faithless, as it says directly in the proverb, will be repaid for all of their ways. Now onto the next matching pair is 10 and 13. And you can look at that again in your scriptures. Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. And then 13, even in laughter the heart may ache, and rejoicing may end in grief. Though someone is laughing on the outside, inside their heart may ache. In fact, only we ourselves, and barely, but definitely the Lord, knows the real status of our hearts. The wise, therefore, do not make decisions based on appearances with people. They don't read books by their covers, or judge books by their covers, rather. Instead, the wise know that humans mask their real feelings, and they wait for the manifestation of the reality. Someone who seems happy today, the wise will know it's just a few short months before they finally re release the grief they've had all along. Then we come to 11 and 12, and 12 is really the, the, the center, but I mean, both of them are the center, the way that it, it moves in, 11 and 12 match up, but 12 really uh, gives the theme perfectly. <clears throat> the comparison in verse 11, as you can see, is between a house or houses or people who have houses and then those who have tents. And that's the main point, this comparison here. When you look at that, there's something within us as human beings. When we look at that appearance, we think the person with the house is stronger, has a brighter future, and I want to be like that. The person in the tent, you're thinking, I really hope I don't go down that path. But that's part of the, the, the point of what real wisdom is here. The wicked have belongings, they have property, and they have resources, and that does give the appearance that they are successful and winning. The righteous may look like the fool because they are often of humble means. Yet in the end, that is an illusion. That's the whole point of, those, of that match. The wise have insight into the fact that the ways of the wicked appear to be good because of the belongings that they have, but in the end, look who flourishes. 
in that verse, in 11 and 12. In 11, the, wicked house, the house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. And now look at 12, which is the, a perfect summation of this whole proverb, and you can see what's, what's going on here. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. And that's the whole point of this proverbial unit, is that the wise are able to see through appearances and into the reality because God has communicated that by his word and given us wisdom through his son and his spirit. So if we were to gather these observations into a doctrine, it would be something like this. People sometimes delude themselves about what course of behavior is beneficial. We sometimes delude ourselves about which course of behavior is beneficial. The wise see where a path leads. The end destination is very important, and the emphasis really throughout all of this is that though it seems a certain way, please know that Jesus Christ in the end will make it this way, and we have to live in light of that. It's the same message that we saw in James when he was talking about the early and the latter rain and telling the people to put their hope in Jesus Christ, though they're presently in that passage being oppressed, being def defrauded, uh, and, and uh, the rest of the list that's in that uh, passage. We sometimes delude ourselves about what course of behavior is beneficial, but as we grow in wisdom, we will see where our path leads. I have a brief um, exhortation here, and then we can move into a time of prayer after song. We really need to be careful about this. I want you to think, for example, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, when you hear things like this, especially when you're young, you're thinking, I have grown up in a good family, I've gone to a good school, I have my head screwed on straight, I really don't think that I'm going to have a poor estimation of what path I should go down. But I would just remind you, remind you that some of the greatest people that have ever existed have walked down uh, paths in delusion. Uh, think, for example, just try to think of some biblical characters where they did have their head screwed on straight, they had all the right upbringing, and then they just make this decision and you just gotta shake your head. Uh, for example, think of David. Uh, David and all that had been given to him, all of the spiritual wisdom that had been handed to him uh, from when he was a young man, the Lord walking with him, those experiences that he had and the wisdom gained from being pursued by Saul. But then we see David set off on a path to have Bathsheba for himself. He arranged all of the details for her husband to be killed and for her to be his wife. Even David must have been deceived at that moment, thinking that that plan was going to result in something good. He, maybe he mapped it all out on paper. Maybe he uh, created a mind map to, to see how all the bubbles would interrelate. Did he do syllogisms and polysyllogisms to make sure that this was going to be a good plan? Uh, he's a, he's a, a diligent person. But even David, at that moment, was deceived. He looked the plan over in his mind, and he thought it was foolproof. But the end was death uh, for his family, and in a sense, his dynasty. Though it went on in Christ, in a sense, he faced largely nothing but heartache from that time forward. Certain ways can seem right in our own eyes but they are not the right ways. We therefore must always call upon God for wisdom in the name of Christ. We must share our plans with our wise friends and family, asking for their counsel, especially when we are young. We must train and be trained to have the right estimation of our endeavors. Are you planning by appearances or are you judging in line with the wisdom of the ancient faith? May Christ make us wise, 
showing us the right path, which leads to his glory and the good of ourselves and others.